kind of understanding that we need to deal with the issues that are soon to come upon us. We know that you have us here to learn to prepare for the final issues that are to strike this earth outlined in Revelation chapter 13. And we want to prepare for it. So we are asking you to help us to understand that with that faith, that revealed truth, that understanding, we will be able to deal with those issues and maintain sin freedom even until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we thank you for hearing us and blessing us right now, giving us your spirit of truth. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 Okay, my dear brethren, we are continuing our study, our explanation of Romans chapter, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, and we need to go into we need to go into a certain aspect of what we have been talking about. So I'm asking you to pay careful attention. You see, evil angels does not want us to learn this message. They want to take this knowledge from your mind, grab it from your mind. So you need to pay careful attention because when these events are taking place, you need to ask yourself what is going on in your mind. If there is a, 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 a slow subversion or a fine subversion, a fascination with the man of sin, if, if a fascination with the man of sin starts in your mind, it will end with you losing your country, your free country. So we want to look at some very important parts in this discussion. And I'm asking that you pay careful attention to what we talk about. We know that time is late. And a lot of events are spiraling out of control. Now how do we know that? Today, there is a grand anti-conscience movement taking place in the world. And that anti-conscience movement is to attack your and my conscience. So we want to look and see what's going on. Recently, there has been are moved by evil angels to push for the events to come faster because they do not like the exposure or, 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 or the light that is shining on the papacy. I know that you right here in this church must admit that you have never seen and understood the papacy as it is, as you have done these days. Amen. 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 With that revelation, there are consequences. So first thing, we will read the scripture we are exegeting. Or, or, or before that, let us look at Second Thessalonians. I want to show you something. Until he be taken out of the way. 
In other words, in Paul's time, what was going to create the papacy was something called the mystery of iniquity. And we are told it was already working. And only God who allowed it, allowed it until it was taken out of the way. That's in 1798. In 1798, when the papacy was moved, it was what? Taken out of the way. But it is the first after that we really want to look at. Verse 8. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be unveiled, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and destroy with what? The brightness of his coming. So here God will destroy the papacy with the brightness of his coming. The Pope that is reigning at that time will remain alive until he sees Jesus coming. And the brightness of Jesus is coming will destroy him. But we are told, but we are told, and then shall that wicked be revealed or unveiled. So before the second coming of Christ, that wicked, the papacy, is to be unveiled. It is to be revealed as never before. And it is this unveiling, this revealing, that we are standing here now. But the unveiling would not only take place in Trinidad and Tobago, it will spread all over the world and it will have to. Why? Because of what happens for them to gain back temporal power. Something must happen for them to gain temporal power. Verse 9 and verse 10 shows it here, which we are not reading now. But something must happen for them to gain temporal power again. But for you to understand that they are gaining temporal power, you need to understand about them. And as we pursue here the wounded to understand what did the papacy lose. Therefore, what will they gain back? You need to pay careful attention. You may not remember every quotation we give, but I will always outline in chart form to make it simple for all of us. So that at least you have a chart that you can quickly follow and say, well, yes, this is it. So indulge me now while I write out this chart for all of you. Two charts. At this point in time, when the Holy Spirit At this point in time, we all need to make sure we understand these important things.
Okay, so first of all, you see global anti-conscious hegemony, right? Which is, which, which is an oppressive dominion. So you have global anti-conscious oppressive dominion. Then you have dominant anti-conscious legislation. Now, anti-conscious legislation is growing in the world. That's what sodomite legislation is all about. Sodomite legislation is about anti-what? Conscious legislation arising. Something people were against me with before, but now they are, they, are, they are trying to drown us out. The European Union has told the Trinidad and Tobago government and the Caribbean nations that we are going to allow you all to travel to Europe free without visa restriction, provided uh -huh. Like they pass human rights law for sodomites. No, no, no. no Europe. No Europe. Yes. As I said before, the European Union has told the Trinidad and Tobago government and the other Caribbean nations that they will remove visa restrictions from traveling to the EU, to EU countries, provided they pass human rights laws so in other words, they're giving people debate. You want to travel without visa restrictions? Without having to pay for a visa? Simply pass the laws. But the question is, why that push for those laws? Because you need to understand the nature of Sodomite legislation. It is always what? Anti-conscience. It is always what? Anti-conscience. Come on, it is always what? What should we don't hear? Anti-conscience legislation. Don't miss this, don't miss this, don't miss this. But anti-conscience legislation comes in different ways. One more chat here for you all, okay? Okay, 
Amen, my dear brethren. Now, we can enter into a wonderful discussion about this whole issue. Okay, my dear brethren. Now, what we're looking at here, we are studying Revelation chapter 13. I have drawn these charts here to make our study more simple and more easy. All I urge you to do is to take the charts down, and if there is anything that will help you to understand in an easy way, are those charts. Now, you need to understand these things. You need to, based upon what is soon to take place. And that is the reason why we have sought to give an unveiling that is very simple for people to understand. Now turn with me to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, first of all. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Is it found? Now this is the study that we are dealing with. I quote, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. Right, this is the topic that we are discussing here, my dear brethren. Now where did we reach? We asked ourselves the question, what did the papacy have that they lost in 1798 when they were wounded? Right. We found out last week that they had something called temporal power. Mm -hmm. Now to you, temporal power means nothing. But to them, temporal power means a lot. Mm -hmm. And millions that were murdered were murdered because of the temporal power of the papacy. That's right. yeah. You say, well, I understand the Pope is a nice man in Rome and he's about peace. The Pope that you see now does not have temporal power. Temporal power is a disease. When he gets that temporal power, persecution arises out of it. Because from, from temporal power comes anti-conscience legislation. And once anti-conscience legislation comes, your conscience is attacked. Your conscience is assailed. And if your conscience is attacked, they will need to say that you will be forced to reject God himself talking to you. And nobody here wants to, have to, wants to be forced to reject God himself talking to them. But this is what anti-conscience legislation does. And those of you who have been studying rights and freedoms, you, are, you better make sure you understand what is anti-conscious legislation a lot because the present push for sodomy with legislation. Those legislations are the beginning of anti-conscious legislation all over the world. But it wouldn't stay with sodomy because that's not the issue. The real issue is when someone is given temporal power and then we will all have to watch out. Oh yes. Listen to me. Way back, in the year 494, what year? 494. After Christ's birth, there was a pope by the name of Pope Jalousius the first. Pope Jalousius the first. He wrote a letter to Emperor Anastasius. And in this emperor, to this Emperor Anastasius, he told the emperor, that there are two powers. He says the spiritual power, and which is the authority of the priest, and the royal power, which is the authority of the king. In this letter, he said, because you kings have to bow to us priests for salvation, Let me quote. 
He's telling the emperor, you are also aware, dear son, that while you are permitted to honorably rule over humankind, yet in things divine, you bow your head humbly before the leaders of the clergy and await from their hands the means of your salvation. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that well, we, our power is greater than your power. Because God permits you to rule temporarily, but you have to come to us to get salvation. Therefore, our power is above your power. And he goes on to show your power must be subject to our power. Way back in 494, before any of us was born, a concept was spread in the then so-called Christian Roman Empire that would affect the history of the world so terribly and create the papacy as we know it today. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen to this. So, the Pope was telling the king, your power is subordinate to my power. My power is about your power. Therefore, it follows that you must submit to my power. This is a bishop in Rome who now begins to be a what? A what? Commonly called a monarchical bishop, which is a bishop that is crowned. And whenever a pope is elected, he is crowned with a triple crown. So he's a monarchical bishop, commonly known as the father, the pope. So that's what he would pope in father. But you see, this can only happen, you can only have a what? A ruling bishop or a what? A monarchical bishop or a what? A pope when you have what? Religious, clerical exclusivism. If only a few people exclusively have grace, and they alone could give grace, then really and truly, you're supposed to submit to them to get it. Yeah. Is that understood? And this is what the Catholic Church says. There's no salvation outside of the world. Church. Amen, brethren? Oh, yes. Amen, brethren? Amen. So what we have here is a Pope, Jealousius, that their power is, super, is super, superior to the temporal power of kings. But the point here is that the Pope is saying in his letter, he is supposed to control the temporal power of the kings. And that's where the papacy's temporal power came from. The temporal power of the papacy is the papacy controlling the temporal power of kings. And when they begin to control temporal power of kings, then they begin to tell you and I, the king begin to tell you and I what it should say. And if you refuse for conscience sake, penalty upon you. Is that understood? Oh, yes. You say, brother, we are living in a modern age of republicanism. That could never happen again. How do you know it could happen? If people's consciences are being trivialized by law, for things that are evidently wrong. That's right. If people's consciences are being criminalized by law for things that are evidently wrong, you know that barbaric ancient concept is slowly what? Rising in a modern age. Well said. Well said. So you have to ask yourself the question, is there anywhere in the world where you find People have to give up their conscience for something they know that is evidently wrong. Is the sodomy evidently wrong? Yes, sir. Does not nature teach it? Yes, So if now you speak against it two years ago, like the guy in Jamaica, two years ago, then afterwards you take up a position in a job to help people who are getting sicknesses. When you take up this job, 
you do your job very good. Somebody looked back two years ago, found what you did, and a Solomite comes and protests and says, we don't want this man here, get rid of him. And the law states, you have to go. They are actually firing a man who is doing a good job because of his belief that touch his conscience. So we have already this anti-conscience attitude arising in the world today. Is that understood? Yes, yes, yes. But wherever you have religious, clerical, exclusivism, you will begin to think only you alone. Only you alone have grace. And therefore, everybody must come to you for grace. Therefore, you begin to rule. Eventually, they crown you. And you become the Pope. Do you see the beginnings of it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, sir. What's that? Yes. What's the religion? Let's put the S, right? Oh, sorry. Sorry. So, the fact that my dear people, these concepts are the gems, yes my dear. Just explain this little thing to this point, because the school comes to have a school of practice, the entire community is that. What they are saying is, they no longer treat more, they no longer trust them. They no longer trust them. And that's why they had to fire him. We'll talk about that this evening, but that is a lie. Complete later, lie. Okay? If the man knows very much when he draws his in practice, what kind of diseases he get? He is more skilled and more able to treat the diseases when you get it. So how come now you are against him? It's more than that, right? We'll talk about that later. Okay, now watch this. Watch this. The facts are, my dear brethren, these concepts are the germs, the beginning of what was later called the temporal reign of the Bishop of Rome over the nations of the world because they believe they have religious clerical exclusivism. The Bishop of Rome became a ruling bishop and then was crowned as a monarchical bishop, which is the Pope. That's what Pope is. Pope, watch me. When you say Pope, the word Pope is a monarchical word, bishop, 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 which means a crown word, bishop, which means he's a word, a ruling bishop, which means he has what? Religious, clerical, exclusivism. He's a cleric that is exclusive with salvation. That's what it means. Listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. It is based upon the error that obedience is due to religious leaders. Listen to me. It is based upon the error that obedience is due to religious leaders because they are religious leaders. And not that obedience is due to God from the truth. Even though the truth is spoken by a person who may be a religious leader or not. So the problem here is when you have the idea that obedience is due to religious leaders, then to you, whether the leader has the truth or not, you will obey him. But if the idea is obedience is, is due to the truth, which comes from God, spoken by the leader or not, if that is your idea, then amen, you are safe from that illusion. Amen. Is that understood, my dear brethren? Here is how Jesus here is how Jesus wants us to look at it. Paul tells us this. To 1 Corinthians 11. 
Turn to First Corinthians chapter 11. And that's what Paul tells us. Furthermore, Jesus clearly tells us that no religious person or secular person is subject to anybody over them. In other words, nobody is subject to anybody over them. We are all subject to Christ who is our Lord. Amen. Let's see how Jesus put it in Matthew 23, 8 to 12. Matthew 23, 8 to 12. So no, listen, so the leader of a state body or a country is not supposed to be um, subject to the leader of a religious organization. Why? Because as far as Christ is concerned, all are just brethren. Sure. And one is the master, Amen. Jesus Christ. Let's see how he put it. Verse 8. But be ye, but, but be not ye called what? Rabbi. rabbi. For one is your rabbi, even who? Christ. Right. And what? All, all ye are brethren. Did you see that, my dear brethren? Yeah. So some people like to go around being called teacher, teacher, teacher. Christ. They don't look for that title. One is the teacher that is Christ. And all ye are what? Brethren. Let's go on. Verse 9. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is where? In heaven. And when he says father, he means father in a religious title. And that's what he would hope means. He would hope means father. So you have one as your father, which is in heaven. It goes on again. Let's read on. Verse 10. Neither be ye called masters. For what is your master, even Christ? But he that will be greatest among you shall be your what? Did you see that? Yes. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be what? Abased. And he that what? Humble himself shall be what? Exalted. So as far as Christ was concerned, the principle was humble yourself. The most humblest person is a person who is recognized. Oh yes. For those who seek to exalt themselves, they will be humble. That's right. And we have some people ingrained in them is this attitude of glorifying themselves and exalting themselves. That always brings humiliation. Mm -hmm. We are nothing and we have one master. Who is that? Yes. Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Just a quick statement, brother Mania. You know, why are religious organizations the direct opposite from what the Buddha goes and call each other father? Why would they do directly opposite? Upon there comes a time when the human conscience is damaged through transgression hmm. and after a while those truths means nothing to them. Hmm. But they just have an agenda and to follow the agenda they will transgress every law in the Bible. Hmm. The latest I have here is that the Archbishop who rules over the Anglican Church has now told the government in Britain every child in Britain or wherever the Anglican is must be taught suddenly now. Hmm. Every child must. And if the Archbishop saying that does he know it is evidently wrong? Yes. But you see, these people have destroyed their conscience so much that they can now do things like that. This is not understood, my dear brethren. Now, 
I am giving you a recent statement of 1912, right? From the Catholic Church. I am reading Father D. F. C. Land in the Western Watchman, June the 27th, 1912. Here's what he tells us. Why is it the Pope has such tremendous power? Here's the priest asking and telling us why. Why is it the Pope has such tremendous power? The answer, why? The Pope is the ruler of the world. That means he has what? That means he has what? Temporal power. That's what he is saying. Why? The Pope is the ruler of the world. All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world are as these altar boys of mine. The Pope is the ruler of the world. You see the mindset? The mindset is clearly claiming that the Pope is the one who has temporal power. All presidents are altar boys of mine. That is what it means to say. And this is their teaching. You say, well, that don't mean anything to me. It won't affect me. If your prime minister is an altar boy of the Pope, watch out. When their principles come, you will get from the altar boys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Western Watchman, June 27, 1912, by Father B.S.P.H.E.L.A.N.C. Lamb. Again, here is this other blasphemous statement. But this statement is 1922. I want to show you that you are not dealing with things that is way back in 1500 and 1600. You're yeah. dealing with it in modern times. This yeah. is 1922. And guess who is speaking? Pope Pius the 11th. Here is what he said, I quote, The hand of God, who guides the course of history, has set down the chair of a vicar on earth in this city of Rome, which, from being the capital of the wonderful Roman Empire, was made by him, God, the capital of the whole world. Mm -hmm. All right. Did you hear what they consider? Mm -hmm. He goes on. Because he made it the seat of a sovereignty, which, since it extends beyond the confines of nations and states, embraces within itself all the peoples of the whole world. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. That is the temple for all people being explained by Pius XI. It goes on. The very origin and divine nature of this sovereign sovereignty, the very origin and divine nature of this sovereignty, they didn't catch that one. He is saying he's God. He says the very origin and divine nature of this sovereignty demands the inviolable demands, are you hearing me now? Yeah. Demands the inviolable rights of conscience of millions, the inviolable rights of what? Conscience of millions of the faithful of the whole world demands that this sacred sovereignty must not be, neither must it ever appear to be subject to any human authority or law whatsoever. So he's saying all our consciences all over the world must recognize that that divine nature on earth, that chair, must not be, and it must not even appear to be subject, right, to any human authority or law whatsoever, even though that law be one which proclaims certain guarantees for the liberty of the Roman Pontiff. So even though your government right and all say, okay, well, the Roman Pontiff, you have such and such freedom. He said, even though they do that, the conscience of millions tells them that nobody has any right to expect us to subject ourselves to anybody. In other words, he's above what? All. Did you see that? And he's saying your conscience will say that too. 
So already they try to involve your conscience in their blasphemy. But it's not because it ends here, it's because there's more to it. Yes. If that was really the fact of the matter, the true fact of the matter, right? Yes. Then we wouldn't have to be forced into believing it. It will be part of our understanding. That's right. So the mere fact that it has to be forced upon us, forced upon our very conscience mm -hmm. as human beings, it shows really and truly. It is not real, it is not the fact. It is not the truth. Mm -hmm. So they will always have to really and truly try to subject our consciences to believe something like that. Mm -hmm. So oppression, persecution will always have to be when it comes to these people. You understand? Because it is not true. And in mere fact, it is not true. When something is not true, you will have to force it upon the minds of others. Or else it would not be there. You understand me? So it just goes to show the persecutive power that the papacy really is from beginning right to the end. Amen, amen. amen. I think that the thing divine is not a check. Cardinal Manning said this, the two powers, the spiritual and the temporal, which is the temporal power of the Pope, are providentially united in Rome. Did you hear what he said? They are what? Providentially united in Rome that they may be separated everywhere else in the kingdoms of the world. So no king could claim that the two powers. Who alone have it? That's what they said. So when the papacy was wounded in 1798, they lost their temporal powers. It's not understood, my dear brethren. It's not understood. Now turn to Revelation 17:18. Revelation 17:18. Is it found? Is it found? Yes. Here is a scripture showing you the temporal power of the papacy. I quote. And the woman which thou sawest, that's the papacy, is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Notice it didn't say we it over the church, we it over what? The, the kings. kings. Now the kings have what? Temporal power. So if this woman rules over the kings of the earth, she rules over the what? The temporal power. But to rule over the temporal power means that the papacy, its temporal power, is its rule over the temporal power of kings of the earth. Mm -hmm. Is that understood, my dear brethren? Yeah. But you see, my dear brethren, the issue of the temporal power of the papacy is an issue of your conscience. You say, oh, brother, I, I don't feel guilty about anything. It is an issue of your conscience before God. Why? Because if the temporal power of the papacy is restored, there will be seen a global, massive, anti-conscience hegemony. And it will come and attack liberty of conscience. I want to refer you all to a statement made by Mrs. White that many people don't seem to understand. Many talking about rights and freedom. The whole issue of rights and freedom, watch me, becomes summarized in conscience. When they talk about your right, they're taking away your right to property, your right to, li to life, to attack your religious liberty. When they're attacking your religious liberty, it's your conscience they're going against, your liberty of what? Conscience. So you see, your whole study on rights and freedoms must divert itself into a study on liberty of conscience. Here is what Mrs. White says in Great Controversy, page 563. Hear what she says, I quote, The time was, are you listening to this? She says, the time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience mm -hmm. which has been so dearly purchased. Mm -hmm. They taught their children 
Notice the context of liberty of conscience. Because Mrs. White seems to know something about conscience referred, refers to the temporary of the paper. See, hear what she says. They taught their children to abhor popery and held that to see harmony with Rome would be disloyalty to God. So she knew something. That is what we want to show you. You ask me what was wounded when the papacy was wounded to death. What did it lose? That is what we want to talk about. It lost its temporal power. Are you listening to me, my dear brethren? Are you listening to me? And this is why the Bible tells us we must stand for your conscience, because what is your conscience? Let's just deal briefly with what your conscience is all about. Okay? Number one, when persecution came from the temporal reign of the papacy, what idea does the Bible tell you about your conscience? Now notice this, persecution comes. What does the Bible tell you about your conscience when persecution comes? Look first at 1 Peter 2.19. 1 Peter 2.19. First Peter 2.19. Did you see? Did you see? Yeah. Did you see the yeah. Persecution comes to you from the temporal reign of the papacy. What is the Bible's advice to you? I read. For this is thankworthy. Mm -hmm. If a man for conscience towards God endure what? Grief. What else? Suffering. 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 Oh. Suffering. Wrongfully. Suffering. Amen, brethren? Take it for the sake of what? Conscience. So when persecution comes, do not let it go against your what? Conscience. Maintain your conscience. Amen, brethren? Is that understood? Amen. So now let's get an idea of what is your conscience. We will take two scriptures and put it together to understand what is your conscience. Two scriptures. We will take John 16, <coughs> verse 7 and verse 8, and Isaiah 1, 18. Let's put them together. And then we will understand what is your conscience. So we will take John 16, 7 and 8. John 16, 7 and 8. We read. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus speaking. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I not, go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he shall reprove. He shall what? Reprove. Notice the word. The word of what? Sin. Of sin. What else? And of righteousness. What else? And of judgment. And of judgment. Stop right here. So the work of the Holy Spirit is to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The Holy Spirit is the one that puts conviction upon your mind that this is sin, and that this is righteousness, so that you can make a judgment. What do you say? Amen. Amen. Amen, brethren? You may not be a Christian, you may be in the world, you may be in a party, and somebody pass a marijuana, a glass of something to drink to you. Immediately I get a conviction, something, I shouldn't be putting that substance in me. Because the Holy Spirit will tell you. Amen. But he just can't be here of sin here, not of righteousness. Yeah. Then somebody speak to you the truth about yourself. And you see yourself. And you're supposed to repent and believe. It is the Holy Spirit that used that person to convict you of sin and of righteousness. Amen. Amen, brethren? Yes. But it is the Holy Spirit that is bringing that conviction of what? Sin, sin. and what else? Right. Righteousness. Now, where does he bring it? So I'm going to say, my conscience is picked. My conscience is touched. 
where does that conviction of sin and righteousness take place in? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Ready? It says, Come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. So God is speaking to your reasoning. Did you see that? God is saying, Come now, let us what? Reason together, says the Lord. It goes on. Though your sins shall be as what? Scarlet. They shall be what? White as snow. Though they be red like what? Crimson. They shall be what? In other words, the Holy Spirit speaks to your reasoning. So watch me now. Your conscience is your reasoning being spoken to by the Holy Spirit of right and wrong. So when the Holy Spirit speaks to your conscience, He is speaking to your reasoning, showing you what is right and showing you what is wrong. Therefore, Liberty of conscience means leave the way open for the Holy Spirit to speak to me. Amen. Amen. Don't interfere with the work of the Holy Spirit on a person's heart. Amen. You didn't get that one. Yes. Liberty of conscience means leave the way open for the Holy Spirit to talk to a person's reasoning. That's right. Do not interfere with the work of the Holy Spirit on a person's heart. <laughs> That's what liberty of conscience is all about. But if you have a global anti-conscience legislation growing, they are telling you when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, reject it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, brother. Study is very tiny. Yes. It's been a wonderful time. Amen. Amen. I just want to quote a text of scripture to show that uh, when Rome interferes with the conscience of men, yes. it is damaged for good. Mm -hmm. I'm quoting a text here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall be part of the world. Giving him to seducing spirits. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with hot iron. iron. Now, in Bible prophecy, Rome is portrayed as the iron, the iron, the metal iron yes. used to represent Rome in prophecy. And exactly. yet, we are being told that persons will depart from the faith, and the Spirit is expressing itself to us, telling us that when that iron power touches the conscience of men, it destroys it. Amen. It Amen. destroys Amen. it. And then we are told, it says here, uh, verse 6. Right? This is for Brother Medina. Verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister. Amen. 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 Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Not Amen. stop in the world of faith. Amen, Amen. Brother. Amen. Amen. When the doors are filled. Yes. 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 That a man, you see a man clear on television smoking marijuana and with a lot of damage and he's saying not to be right. That's the damage to people's conscience. Yeah. 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 Romans 9 1. Which shows that your conscience is influenced by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, what touches the conscience points to the Holy Spirit. 
We read Romans 9 1. I say the truth in Christ. I what? What? My conscience also bearing me witness where? In you. That's right. It is the Holy Spirit that speaks to your reason that is your conscience. And the conscience bear witness to you in the Holy Spirit when you speak the truth. What do you say about right. this? Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. It is the Holy Spirit that speaks to your conscience or speaks to your reasoning about morality. Who of it? John chapter 8 and verse 9. John chapter 8 and verse 9. Let's go on. John chapter 8 and verse 9. We see it is the Holy Spirit that speaks our reasoning about morality. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in there. So here's what had happened. They, they set the poor woman up, let the man go free, pay him his money, take the woman and bring her before Christ because she was caught in adultery. And they say, Master, this woman was caught in adultery. Moses and the Lord said she should be stoned to death. What do you say? We'll see. If Christ said, don't stone her to death, they'll say, so you're going against the law. <laughs> if Christ says stone her to death, they'll say, well, you see, you agree with us. So Christ watched them. And when Christ take a look at a person, brother, it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to say. And one look at all of them, Christ just do so. And he started right on the ground. The sins he knew that these priests and others were committed. So as the group of them stand up there watching, and this one see his sin, that one see his sin, that one see his sin, each of them quietly move on. In other words, this one don't know that one is my sin, but let me move on to the group. That one don't know this is my sin, so let me move on to the group. But we have been told they were convicted in their work. So it is the Holy Spirit speaking to a reasoning. That is the conscience. Amen? Amen. And he speaks to a reasoning about morality. Amen, Amen brethren? Amen. Amen. Amen? So much. This is so. To obey conscience. In the face of tricks of persecution, listen to me. To obey conscience in the face of tricks of persecution is expressed in the New Testament or the second witness in such a way that shows the overwhelming influence of the Holy Spirit upon the reasoning. Mm -hmm. The first example God gave us of the apostles facing persecution or tricks of persecution related to their conscience. Amen. Acts chapter 4. Amen. But we read 18 to 20 to see the whole thing. Acts chapter 4, 18 to 20. To obey conscience in the face of threats of persecution is expressed in the New Testament in a way that shows the overwhelming influence of the Holy Spirit upon the human reason. In other words, the first example God gave to us of, of the apostles facing persecution was with regards to their conscience. Let's look at it. Verse 18. Acts chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. We read. 
And they called them and commanded them. Notice this. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the world the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered, answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you, judge for yourself. Why? Now here is that conscience comes. Because for we cannot but speak the things which we have what? Seen and heard. We have heard The things that they saw and heard was the Holy Spirit educating them. Amen, Amen. brethren? Amen. And they couldn't but speak that. In other words, watch me now, watch. Freedom of speech Amen. relates to liberty of conscience. Amen. Did you hear that? Amen. Freedom of speech relates to freedom of conscience. Yes. But watch. Religious liberty, which was being transgressed here, was against liberty of conscience. Yes. Did you see that? Yes. That's why the whole issue must turn to what? Liberty yes. of conscience. Because when they pass a law telling you not to do this, they are telling you, disobey the word of the Holy Spirit on your heart. Yes. And for you to do that is to make you apostatize and commit your part of the sin. They want you to come in your part of the sin. That's what they want you to do. So you must understand it is an issue of conscience. But let's look furthermore. Later on, Peter and John explain themselves even better. Look at Acts chapter 5. What is it? The unpardonable sin is rejection of the Holy Spirit based upon all the truths you place upon your mind. When you reject the truths of the Holy Spirit with error, and you go into error fighting against the truth of the Holy Spirit and rejecting it, that is the unpardonable sin. Why? Because the Holy Spirit cannot reach you for you to get pardoned. Mm. That's why it's called the unpardonable sin. They cannot be reached to get pardoned. Because every time the Spirit speaks to you, yeah, but now I come up to me this. Yes. Yeah. Every time this Spirit shows you the truth, you have something to fight against the truth with. And therefore you never get understanding, you never could repent, and you never could be forgiven. Mm. So you call it the unpardonable sin. So do I explain that what he said, all transgressions of man coming will be forgiven to him. But the sin against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. That's what he told us. That is not part Watch this. Every Pharisee and scribe, watch me. They see Jesus preach the pure truth. They see Jesus heal people. And they watch and say, that's the devil who thinks. That is. Everything that you can show that the truth is here, they saw it. Mm -hmm. They rejected, reasoned it away with an error, and the error that reasoned it away made them come to this conclusion, that is Belzebub or, or evil spirits and Satan working. Mm -hmm. And that is why Christ warned them about them part of the city. The reasoning that the Jews of them followed was this pattern. Anybody who do any good thing, any righteous act, any preaching of any truth, once it doesn't ratify that the state of Israel is the supreme thing that's supposed to last forever, they are of the devil. So when Jesus preaching the truth, if the truth continues, the Jews will have to forgive the Romans and love the Romans. They will lose their national identity, and therefore Jesus could be of God. He had to be of the devil. That was the error, and that error developed eventually into what we know today as the Talmud and communism and the constant legislation we are facing today going against our country. Yeah. Yeah. Now Acts chapter 5, 27 to 29. Here is the same thing again. Later on the disciples face it again. Here what was here what was their answer? Acts chapter 5, 27 to 29. We read. 
And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey who? We ought to obey what? So when God speaks to your conscience, Obedience to their conscience is obedience to who? Oh. Rather than? Man. Is that understood, my children? <laughs> so the fight against, watch me, listen. The fight against the temporal reign of the papacy, and this is the reason why I'm talking to you here now, and I'm trying to make you see something a certain way. I am trying to make you see something a certain way, I'm trying to make you understand it. We have nothing against the Pope as a human being no. or the Roman Catholic Church. But your fight against the temporal reign of the papacy is a fight to preserve your conscience. Amen. 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 You want to know why? Here is Mrs. White again in the great controversy. Here is what she tells us. I quote, The Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. She's telling us, nothing is dearer or more fundamental. Yeah. What did Mrs. White say? Nothing, nothing is dearer or more fundamental. What? Nothing, nothing is dearer or more fundamental. Why would she say nothing is dearer or more fundamental? Because none of us will survive if the Holy Spirit can't speak to us. Yeah. <laughs> The dearest thing to all of us, the fundamental thing to all of our Christianity and obedience is the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Amen. Amen. Amen, brethren? Amen. I read again. The Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is dearer or more fundamental. Then Mrs. White continues here, Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical letter of August the 15th, 1854, said, quote, the absurd, here the Pope speaking, the absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilent error. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see who find liberty of conscience a most pestilent error? Mm -hmm. The Pope. Let me read again. Pope Pius in his encyclical letter of August 15, 1854, said, the absurd and erroneous doctrine or ravens in the sense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential error. He continues, a pest of all others. What did he say? A pest of, a, of all others. Most to be dreaded in a state. What? Yes, brother. I just want to share some stuff. I just want to look up here to show that the operation of the Holy Spirit is very important. Amen. Amen. Right? Acts chapter 2. And pay attention to what he's quoting here. He's going to show that the, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is most important. Acts yeah. chapter 2, what verse? Right, verse 37, 38, and 41. 37, 38, 41. Amen. Okay. 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 Now, when they heard this, words of, okay, or words of, they were pricked in their hearts by, by a conviction of the Holy Spirit. And it goes on. 
and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The feet, right? Then Peter said unto them, Repent ye, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right? It's what you want. It says, they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So you see, the, 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 this conviction, by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when this leads to conversion of men. And when the Holy Spirit cannot speak to our conscience, it will lead to no conversion of men everywhere. Amen. Amen. That's the important thing. Amen. And you see, this is, you see, this is the important thing. This is exactly so the brother actually does Conviction from the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the, the line of importance that they deliver here. Amen. The important thing is, why are we against the papal institution? You say, brother, they're not harming me now. But you do not understand what is going to happen. What is going to happen is coming soon. And the Bible doesn't make the Muslims or the Hindus of government the center of problem and prophecy. It makes the paper to the center of the problem. And there's a reason why. The reason is because they are coming to stop you from listening to the Holy Spirit. To cause you to be lost at a time when the end is coming. Just as the end is coming, and you need to consider the truth to follow Christ, to be saved, they are coming to stop the Holy Spirit from speaking to your reason. Do you get that clear? That's what you must understand. So when you're against the temporal reign of the papacy, now I'm, I'm sure you're beginning to see the chart explaining itself. You understand? When you're against the temporal reign of the papacy, you know what you're against. Amen, brethren? You know what you're against. Watch this. Mrs. White continues. I continue what she said. She said this. The same Pope, in his encyclical letter of December the 8th, 1864, anathemized those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship. Also, he said this, all such as maintain, also, he anathemized all such as maintain that the church may not employ force. Hmm. So if you say the church must use force, he said nothing more to you for that. You speak about religious liberty, um, liberty of conscience, and nothing more for you. This issue about conscience is the most pestilent error, dreaded in a state. So you need to understand what you're dealing with. When we are talking about the temporary reign of the papacy, we are talking about your conscience. Amen, brethren? This is the reason why the tide of anti-conscience legislation now beginning to sweep the world favors the healing of the paper room. Because this healing means the revival of what we call global anti-conscience hegemony. Amen, brethren? That is what it means. And Satan is preparing people's minds with, with sodomite legislation. Yes, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. sir. Mm -hmm. A state that has the doctrine of um, freedom of conscience, yeah. or liberty of conscience, with that, with that doctrine prevailing, it can destroy the people, the Pope, and his temporal reign or temporal power. Because the doctrine of liberty of conscience attacks his temporal reign or temporal power. Because if they have temporary and temporal power, if they have liberty, liberty over the conscience of men, we see the same conscience. But if the doctrine that everybody conscience is free, you understand? And free for the dictator, you working at the Holy Spirit, it does have a limited temporal power. So that is why he says I'm a specimen error. Because it's why we make him be in the position he in the papacy. So that doctrine can have destroyed the foundation of the papacy. Amen. Properly well said. Now, now let's look at the chart. Now let's look at the chart. So, come religion. Right? Come 
commune religion, from communism and religion put together. Communism usually says no religion. You have no religious activity. You must follow no religion. But when a power tell you you have no religious activity, but follow this religion, that is not communism, but communion. Yes. You get the idea? Yes. Listen to me again. Yes. Communism from Karl Marx says no religion. It says all these rights and freedoms are bourgeoisie invention. <laughs> but communism does away with them, he says, in the Communist Manifesto. So communism tells you no religion. No religion at all. No religious liberty, no religion. However, when a power comes and tells you no religious liberty, but follow this religion by force, they cannot call it communism. You have to call them up. Communism. Amen? Amen? So in the temporal reign of the papacy enforces what? Communism. That's right. Now let's look at the other part of the chart. Revelation 17, 18 speaks about a what? A global what? And the what? Did you see that? Which is what? Dominant what? Anti-conscious legislation. You see, republicanism means you have legislation that is dominant, that is pro-conscious. Yes. You didn't hear me? Yes. That's what republicanism says. Republicanism says that you have legislation that is dominant, that is pro-conscious. So that will tell you freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of belief, freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, you know, freedom of conscience. It will tell you all of that. Why? Because the legislation in republicanism is not anti-conscience, but pro-conscience. Yes. This morning, Brother Aaron played a clip for me. from Mr. Ted Cruz, a Texan senator, who stands up and tells the American public something the Republic, the, the Democrats are seeking to do. The Democrats always claim that it's for black people, and black people this. They never tell people that during the 1800s, it was the Republicans that were for black people, and it was the Democrats that try to, to encourage slavery. Yeah. They never tell people, so they come and claim that we moral high ground. But Ted Cruz came and tell, he said, 41 Democrats signed a bill, and the bill is to repeal the first amendment clause in America. Ooh. I actually saw him telling them, he says they want to stop you. They want to stop your free speech. All the new clause they want to put is that nothing shall stop the freedom of the press. But they leave out everything about religious liberty, everything about freedom of speech. And he said 41 Democrats, not Republicans, but who? Democrats. Why do you think they are against freedom of speech and freedom of religion? Because they don't want you in your religion and in your speech to show the nonsense that they're doing. To show the nonsense they're doing. Nancy Pelosi stands up, that crazy woman, God forbid, and boasts that she can get legislation to make America do whatever they want. And if you hear the foolishness that she wants to legislate, now they are actually crafting legislation to take away your religious liberty and free speech. 41. The Democrat has already signed it. Wow. When you see that, that whole behavior is an anti-conscience behavior. Amen. 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 And you better, you better see it so from now on. You have to learn to start seeing things the right way. Because your conscience is God speaking to your reasoning. Anti-conscience means they're trying to stop God from speaking to you. Amen. They're trying to intervene between the Holy Spirit and your mind. Mm -hmm. 
They try to put a block here. Mm. So when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you won't be able to reach you. Mm. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you lost. Mm. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Watch again. So Revelation. If you want Revelation 17, 18 in the form of a chart, Revelation 17, 18 is this. Global what? Which would mean that the nations must have what? Which means those nations must have what? Which means those nations must have what? That's how the legislation must be. The dominant legislation must be anti-culture. But here is dominant anti-conscious legislation. You ask, how could we have dominant anti-conscious legislation dealing with religion? Three things. They could do what? They could do what? Enforcement of religion. That is anti-conscious. You can force religion on a people. Let you only first speak to the person. Or it may be what? So that if you go to expose the religion, they'll say, blasphemy, blasphemy. Prejudice, prejudice. You know, hate crime, hate crime. Or they may come and say, bigger, bigger. Or they may come and say, discrimination. They may use terms to mean they must protect that religion. So, religion, protection of religion is a what? Anti-conscious anti legislation, dominant anti-conscious, and furthermore, what else? Protection of religion. Did you see that, my dear brethren? Did you see that? Yes. So watch me. When you go to speak a religion, they say, no, 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 no. That's wrong, they can't speak it. So they're prohibiting your religion. But if the Holy Spirit is telling you to say that, how dare they tell you not to say it? Mm -hmm. If the Holy Spirit shows you what faith to follow, how oh, dare they tell you what faith you shouldn't follow <laughs> and outlaw it? <laughs> so whenever you have, watch me again, pay attention to your chat now that you understand. Once you have what? <laughs> Revelation 17, 18. It would mean you must have what? <laughs> Amen, you see it? Which would mean you will have what? Enforcement of religion. As one person's religion. What else? Protection of religion. You enforce religion. They protect it. And what else? Prohibition of religion. The religion opposed to do. And that will be what? Communism. That's right. That will be what? Communism. And that is what? You got it. Did you see it? Yes. Now I hope I was able to forge a proper tie between the temporal reign of the papacy and anti-conscious legislation. So you ask, what did the papacy lose in 1790? You and I we were born in a period of time when nobody was forcing religion upon you. And they say, well, we in the Western world, we are free, we are happy. Hey, it wasn't so all the time, you know. You could trace and see when that started. It started after 1798. Why? Because in 1798, you can see laws as well. That's right. And that's how come we are free. We can now begin to look in and study and preach the truth. All kind of religions start to come up. But also all kind of heresies. Heresies some people who allow their conscience to be damaged. But the truth is still there. Yes. The government is just a man like you and I. They can't regulate and see which one should preach and which one shouldn't preach. It's like if you put your neighbor in a house here in power and your neighbor is not telling everybody who to preach or who not to preach. But then you go back in his house out of power. Amen. 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 There are certain ideas. There are certain ideas that create 
This chart we just saw here, this global anti cultural hegemony chart, there are certain ideas that create that chart, that create that system. When it begins, it must begin there. Religious one. Some religious parents feel that he exclusively alone have the truth. And therefore, he alone, everybody should follow by law. Hmm. It will start here. After a while, that person becomes a what? And therefore, what? Which is what? It is these ideas starting underneath that led to what you see here. Do you get that term I get man? It is these ideas that led. But I have something shocking to show you. In the scripture, God made sure he placed certain truths there that watch me, watch, that these ideas will never arise if you follow the truth. Amen. If you follow the truth and these ideas never arise, then this whole thing here will never be a problem. Mm. If you, if you follow the truth that attacks religious spiritual exclusivism, right? Yes. If you follow this truth, then global anti cultural hegemony will never arise. Mm. Are you listening to me? Yes. So watch. If the wounding of the papacy, and that's what we're coming to, eh, is to heal, these ideas must come back. Amen. 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 The ideas of religious clerical exclusivism must come back. But wait. I know some of you have been trying to interpret what the Pope has been doing over the years. And some people say, well, look, the Pope going here, look, he going here, look, he going here, look, he going here. What they do not understand is that the papacy has a plan. And the plan is to build back the idea that they have what? That's what the Pope has been doing. That is what they have been trying to build. The latest venture, I am afraid, I have to say, I wish he failed. <laughs> I wish he fell for greater good. Why? The latest venture Pope Francis has set out to do. Everybody knows the issues between the Palestinian and the Israelis have been the most uncurable problem. Amen? Amen? Because you're dealing with, with people most often who already have rejected the work of the Holy Spirit upon their heart. That's right. So how could you get a man? trying to cure that problem. I'm coming to you, brother Ella. Come to you right now, right? How could he get a man trying to cure that problem? The Pope has now gone to try and create two states. Palestinian state alongside an Israeli state. Mm -hmm. Where all the presidents of the United States, the United China, Nations, China, Europe, China. China, everybody has failed to do. This small quarter mile territory ruler <laughs> has now gone to try to cure it. Brethren, I know millions of Palestinians have been murdered by the Israelis. I know the Israelis throw fast, fast bombs, take the children, put it in front, and let them get shot by the hide behind them. I know that their favorite target is shooting the heads of Palestinians, shooting them to the head as target practice. I know they have them in, many of them jailed without any charges, and I know that they feed in them all kind of chemicals to damage your brain and all these sort of things. It's bad, it's hard, and it's painful. But I tell you, if the Pope does get through stopping that, all of us in trouble. The peace of the Palestinians will just be for a while because world peace will go. That's why God put him in a quarter square mile place and doesn't keep himself quiet. <laughs> But you are seeking to build back religious clerical work. Exclusivism. But wait. I would like to come to the point to show you what religious clerical exclusivism means to the Pope. 
least you could understand what it means to him. So he's going around trying to build back this exclusivism that he has. And the paper is following it. Now there are charts and pictures placed over Wall Street, New York and other places where the Pope flies with a Superman. Okay, they call him Super Pope now. Do you know who is behind it? You see, that is a dangerous thing. To you and I, it's just an ordinary thing, but it's a dangerous thing. Because what he lost, he is seeking to get back. But for him to get it back, he must first start off claiming he has what? Religious exclusivism. He must start off with That's where he must start. So please, go ahead. Yes, and what I know that uh, an unconscious against God, like something against God. Yes. Yeah. Um, hegemony. Hegemony means an overbearing rule. Overbearing dominance. Overbearing dominance. Is he going to be financed by whether the Jews finance him or not is irrelevant. The issue is what about his image? Watch me. You want me to try something? Let me go to the United Nations office in Trinidad to be God say, I am a human being. I offer myself to go and negotiate between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I will bring peace. Yeah. Yeah. You know what they will ask? Who are you? <laughs> That's what they will ask. They will ask what? Who are you? What authority do you have? But you know nobody asks who is Pope Francis. You know why nobody asks? Because they are already beginning to see him having what? They see him as a what? As a what? As who? That's what they see. You get that fair? You get that fair? So these ideas must be built back. The shocking thing, it was the Reformation that destroyed those ideas. It was the Reformation that destroyed those ideas. And I read a statement by the Catholic Church is bitterly reproaching, reproaching the Reformation and saying, oh gosh, you are the one that made people start as you are so. Then came the French Reformation. Now let's look at our few scriptures before we finish. Here is why God gave these scriptures to make sure these ideas do not become current in people's minds. First one, first John 227. First John 227. The papacy think it alone is the dispenser of grace and salvation. Therefore, it must teach you. Here are the Bible says, I quote, For the anointing which ye have received from him, from who him? God, the Holy Spirit. For the anointing which you have received of him abideth where? In you. And you need not that any man wash you. Why? But as the same anointed teaching you what? Of all things and his word, truth and his word, no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall what? Amen. Amen. We don't need them to teach us. The Holy Spirit can teach you what he says. Just abide in him. And he will continue to teach you what he says. Amen. Amen. With that text, you don't need anyone having a religious clerical word. Exclusivism. Amen, Amen, brethren? Amen. Amen, brethren? In fact, it is the Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. 
and dispenses grace and salvation. Amen? Amen. But you see, what the Catholic Church claims is that they are the priests, you are the followers. We are the followers. But the Bible says, no, 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 no. Every believer is a priest. If every believer is a priest, you don't need a priest exclusive. That's right. That's right. Let's look at 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation. Did you see what you are? You are what? Chosen generation. And what else? A royal priesthood. And what else? A holy nation. And what else? A peculiar people. That you should what? Show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his what? Hallelujah. Which is diapers were what? Not a people, but a what? Now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now what? Amen. So you don't need them. Amen. You see, we don't need the Pope. Because you are a priest. That's right. Who can tell me why the book of Revelation started this way? In one of its early verses. Revelation 1. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 5 and 6. Revelation 1. Five and six. Do you see why Revelation started this way? Amen. In Revelation 1, 5 and 6, do you see why this is here now? Because Revelation is really dealing with global anti cultural hegemony, which is the temporal reign of the Pope. So this is the reason why this scripture was put here in Revelation 1, 5 and 6. Did you see it? Amen. That's why it started to say, and from whom? Jesus Christ, who is what? The faithful witness. And what? The first begotten of the dead. And what? The prince of the kings of the earth. So who is the one ruling the prince of the earth? Jesus Christ. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. Not a, not, not, not a woman having great dominion over the kings of the earth. Not the papacy. Jesus Christ is the prince of the what? The kings of the earth. But watch on, watch on, watch on. It goes on. Right? Mm -hmm. It says, uh, unto him that what? Loved Love Love us. And what? Washed us from our sins. Yes. Where? Yes. Yes. And I made us what? Kings yes. and priests. Yes. Amen. Amen. He has made us what? Kings yes. and priests. So that is why Revelation starts that way. Yes, because it tells you, with the priesthood of the believer, you are king, and Christ is the king over all of us. We don't need Religious what? We do not need a what? A what? We do not need the Pope. So once those ideas, those scriptures settle in your mind, this year will never happen. Therefore you will never have global and commercial testimony. Amen, brethren? Amen, brethren? Amen, brethren? Amen. Watch me. Somebody wants to know what Brother Medina, where's the solution? The solution is always a personal religious experience. Yes, sir. You know that's the problem? The problem is that people there's now personal religious experience. Let me just tell you something. You see, there is this Adventist television program that comes on every Sunday at 8 30. On television. What's the name of it? From the remark. Revolutionary Revelation. This has been this they always speak about what day you worship on. Do you worship on a Sunday or do you worship on a Sabbath? God doesn't want to say if the issue is not what day you worship on. You're supposed to worship God on every day. Amen. But you see, worshiping on a day, a particular day, is a ritual. You see, the Sabbath is not about the day of worship God. The Sabbath is just another way of saying, since we live. Amen. 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 That's a whole study I have on fire. 
all you have to do is to read what the Bible says about Sabbath keeping. Not thinking your own thoughts, doing your own thing. The man you have to be sincere. Amen. 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 The Sabbath is really another way of saying a day of sin finished. Amen. But it can only be so to you if you have a personal experience. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you should not what day you worship on. From the moment it becomes what day you worship on, it becomes a ritual. Yes, sir. You see, the opposite of personal experience is ritualism. Mm -hmm. So if you want to put subject opposite, write it down in your book, subject opposite. Personal experience, subject opposite, ritualism. So true, so true, so true. You see, you can do plenty elaborate rituals and then you shh. You see, that's why Muslims could murder, kill, rape, mm -hmm. and 50 miles. Mm -hmm. And then feel their righteous still. Mm -hmm. Because they do plenty ritual. Afterwards, they go and listen, they put their face on the ground. Yeah. Well, humiliate themselves. Mm -hmm. And they do it over and over and over and over. So the rituals make you feel righteous. Mm -hmm. When you are not righteous. Mm -hmm. Did you hear me? Yes. The rituals make you what? Feel yeah. righteous. That's why I'm a Hindu. Running after money like madness in the country. Mm -hmm. But not only here, all over. Yeah, all over. Mm -hmm. You would think a religion that claims to be the most spiritual is so materialistic. Mm -hmm. If only money, there's money that corruption, money, corruption, money, racism, all kind of things. Mm -hmm. Just this week, a, a, a 13 year old and a 14 year old girl, no charity here, they're going to relieve themselves in the bushes. Four, fam four boys. Four boys hold them, repeatedly raise them and then hang them high. When they talk to the police, the police will do nothing about trying to find the girls. Had they found the girls, they would have found them and saved their lives. That is in India. That's in India. And, and do you know what happened yesterday now? Do you know what happened yesterday now? Four brothers rape and next little girls. Yes. Do you know what? The mother of one of the girls who was raped and hung while walking in the street, the father of one of the boys that raped the girl beat the mother so bad, break up all her bones. They tell him to drop the kids. Yesterday it happened. They claim they're so precious and they're so holy and look at their state. Look at their country. There's a whole set of corruption. There's a whole set of wrong. So much materialism. And you know why they, they feel they could do it and feel good? Why they could do that wrong and feel they're still righteous? Because afterwards, there's a whole set of ritual. Throw water up to the sun. Sprinkle right in you. Do a whole set of pooch and a whole. Listen, some of them, their conscience is rotten. Like the cigarette, make their lungs become. And they just pour a push and they feel righteous. You see, ritualism has the, the baleful ability of making you feel righteous when you're not righteous. But the opposite of ritualism is personal experience. You see, in the Catholic Church, it's ritual after ritual. Throw the holy water, walk with the sunburst, you understand, mutter some Latin, all sorts of rituals. When you finish with you, you have the most genuflect cultural form. A person could swear you are holding them down. Because you really see. But no personal experience. So the opposite of ritualism is what? Personal experience. Is what? Personal experience. Therefore, the only way to deal with religious, clerical exclusivism is what? It's happening a what? experience. Which means the Holy Spirit must speak to what? Your conscience. Oops, you get the idea now. You get the idea now. It is ritualism attacking personal experience. That is what this is all about. When they attack your conscience, it is ritualism attacking personal experience. Amen? Yes. Yes. You're not seeing what I'm saying. Yes. You see, you're going to the heart of this thing. You know why I'm going to the heart of this thing? Because Everybody something big going to happen. Yes. And you have to understand. So let's just give one scripture that uses personal experience. Just one. 
The guy who is made up of that after all, just give me one. Before we finish. Okay. No. So watch me. Do you remember 80 Jones wrote a book called Individuality in Religion? Yes. Why did he write about individuality in religion? That must always be individual individuality in religion must always be the experience to deal with the whole issue. You see that it, it boils down to now watch me. I meet a person and I deal with the person. And when I'm dealing with the person, what is my personal religious experience? Mm. The problem he has with me or I have with him is based upon personal religious experience. Or no problem, the unity is based upon what? Personal yes. religious experience. Unless he comes to me and I put my foot up on all kind of funny way and do all kind of funny things, throw all kind of water at him, and then tell him, oh, so let him leave, you know, feeling some kind of holiness there. But you see, when you have personal religious experience, they feel empty. Something wrong. You listen. The Catholic Church have them walking up on their knees on the stairs and confessing and praying. The priest say, okay. Damage. I will tell you what you do. You lie. You steal from your parents. You did this and that. You commit sexual immorality. You curse people. Okay. You're going to do penance. You say five million years. Five. Holy Mary, five daily, five holy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> ten guys. So the person go and, and he do my shop and he say, I'm holy to touch one of the things. Why? And the poor person go and kneel down and watch me. Two hours pass and then mutton on the mirror, my little mother, my face, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll by the time the person finish and get up so listen, they are an angel of our people. Yeah. Yeah. But pure religion, true religion, is lacking in the person. Yeah. So let's give you one speaker, personal. Now, the reason why I tell you about ritualism versus personal experience, because we have to have a whole study of that. Eh? You see, say, Tuesday, what's the difference between you, Tuesday, and the Adventist church? We have a personal experience. You see, what's the difference between Tuesday and the ordinary and the Adventist church? We believe in what? Personal religion. They believe in worshiping on a day. Every time I hear the fellow preacher, it is always touch me. Why are you always worshiping? They worship on a Sunday, we worship on a Sabbath, there's no difference. Because what are they only doing rituals? You just do it on the Sabbath. The Jews do rituals on the Sabbath too. Mm -hmm. But the Sabbath is only sin free days. You see, I'm telling you something, I don't know if you're reading what I'm saying between the lines. The Sabbath is sin free days. You didn't hear what I just said? Yeah. Somebody said, you know, you know what is the Sabbath? I said, well, you have the ordinary day. But during that 24 hours, the work is supposed to do is only works associated with God. And that is the work you're supposed to do. Give up your own secular labor for that day. Your thoughts must be thoughts of God. You mustn't speak your own words. You mustn't be your own thoughts. Have your own feelings, have your own desires. Only abide in the truth, only preach, only congregate and do all that. Is that what you're calling for me to be sin free? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That is what the Sabbath is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're not seeing it, you know. Yeah. 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 What you experience as sinfulness is the Sabbath. Yeah. 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 That's why the highest commandment of all the ten, oh. the highest of all those ten years, is the one that tells you sinfulness. The Sabbath. Some people say, but Jesus said, the first commandment is worship God. Who did I not just say it? St. Phoenix is what? Worship God. Amen. 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 Amen.
What they want you and I, they want to make us become a ritualist. Mm. Not me, brother, brother, amen? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm afraid of that word. <laughs> you understand? Well, I shouldn't say afraid because I don't have ritual phobia. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm a ritual rejecter, what do you say? Yeah. Amen? It's an Ephesian street. Ephesian street, some of you are like that. I had a text on the same point. Go ahead. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. Straight on from speaking. Let's say, and here it, do I exercise myself? For we have. Show the text out again. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. Let's say, and herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience void of offense towards God and toward men. Amen. 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 A conscience void of offense towards God, God and towards men. Amen. Amen. First of all, then tied into your conscience. Amen. Beautiful scripture. Amen. It's a super scripture. Amen. The only reason why I didn't put that scripture is because that's a whole study by itself. But you throw it out there. Eh? <laughs> When you try to be can be pulled back, eh? <laughs> so watch me now. So so we look at Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. Just this one scripture you before we finish off this thing. We read that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit where? In the man. Where? In the man. So you want to be strengthened with the spirit where? In the man. What is more personal experience than that? Amen. The Holy Spirit strengthening you in your inner man. Amen. But wait. What does it mean to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in your inner man? Let's see. It is put this way, that what? Christ may what? Well in what? Your heart's what? That you may be what? Rooted and grounded in love. Did you see that? It is the same as saying Christ dwelling in your heart through the faith according to the Greek text. That you may be rooted and grounded in love. You know what it is to be grounded in love? It means only love in you. You're grounded, you have a root. You have a root of ground something, you know, a pole, you have ground it in concrete, or you're rooted in concrete. So you must be rooted and grounded in love. That means the only thing is that you're just under love too. What could be more personal than that? That is what it means to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the inner man. But wait. Rooted and grounded in love. It goes on. Right? May be able to. So because you're rooted and grounded in love, you are not able to what? Comprehend with what? All the things. What is the what? The right and what else? The length and what else? The depth and what else? The height. Go ahead. And to know the love of Christ, which exceeded what? Which passes what? That you might be filled with what? All the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. What can be more personal experience than that? Now that all scriptures are studied by itself, which we can go to know. But when you say full with all the fullness of God, it means the ten principles of the spiritual law. Amen. The spiritual law, the nature of God in you, Amen. through the faith of Jesus Christ. If you say what saying, you have the character of Christ, the nature of God. Mm. The character of God, Same the nature thing. of God in you, and you're rooted in it. Mm. That is what it means to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the inner man. Amen. Amen, Amen brethren? Amen. That is personal religion. Amen, Amen brethren? Amen. That is personal experience as against rituals. Mm. And as I tell you, that's a study we have coming up by itself, yeah? Mm. So one last thing, one or two last scriptures now, and then we close off. What did Jesus say? Since Jesus spoke about personal experience, what did Jesus say about a monarchical bishop or a ruling bishop? What did Jesus say about that? Finally, Matthew 20. 
25 to 27. Matthew 28, 25 to 27. So Jesus is speaking to the disciples and Peter also. And you know the Pope always like to call and say, well, Peter was the first Pope. Well, if Peter was the first Pope, it means Peter disobeyed Jesus here. Because here's what Jesus is speaking about, a monarchical or ruling bishop. A crowned bishop or ruling bishop. Here's what Jesus says about it. We look at Matthew 28, 25 to 27. But Jesus called them unto him and said, so this is not just like Jesus just spoke, is it? You see, Jesus, let me tell you something. If you will, let, let us say, we take your mind that you have today now and carry it back in the past and tell you, okay, walk with Jesus, go along with it. With the understanding you have now, you will catch Jesus giving lessons. Oh, well, that's why he said that, because you know later on in the future, this will happen and you will be so. <laughs> why is that? He, but he really had his prayer prophecy. Amen. That is the real testimony of Jesus. Amen. That's what you will say. Amen. Right? You yourself will say that. You will see. So, you know why Jesus gave this statement? Let's see why he did it. Let's look. Really. So, in, in this one here, he didn't just was talking by the way. He thought about certain things. And then he tell you this happened. Yo, come, 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 come. He literally called them and tell them to fill up. I want to tell you something. Why would Jesus call them to tell them this? Because he saw this was absolutely important. Once obeyed, we would never have the whole chant on top. Let's see. Let's see what Jesus told them. From verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles as temple rulers exercise dominion over them. Mm. Who does that? Temporal rulers. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Let me read it again. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Amen. Christ is saying, no ruling bishop, no monarchical bishop. It shall not be so among you. And Peter is here in that. So if Peter was the first pope as they say, then Peter disobeyed Jesus. That Peter is a Peter that comes in your time, that was this. But the pope, not Peter. It goes on. It says here, but it shall not be so among you. For whosoever will be great among you, let him be your what? Master. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your what? Master. And then Christ even give an example. He said, even I, I myself didn't come to anybody to serve me. I was the great Lord. I could have come home and said, I am the king of the universe. He said, I just come to minister and give my life a ransom for many. Yeah. Do as I did. I, I just came to do that. One more scripture, chapter 23. Matthew 23, 8 to 12, and then we finish. You read this just now. Christ tell them. But be not ye, but be not ye called rabbi. For one is your rabbi, even Christ. And all ye are what? Brethren. And call no man your papa or pope upon the earth. For one is your papa, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters. For one is your master, even Christ. But he that shall be greatest among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be what? Yes. And he that shall what? Arm himself shall be what? Right, so in conclusion. Religious clerical exclusive the a ruling bishop, a monarchical bishop, a crown bishop, triple crown, which is the Pope, Jesus spoke against the day, amen? Yeah. And had this never happened, you would have never had global anti conscious hegemony. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Now we're going to have to stop here. Amen.
Then shall that wicked be what? Unveiled. Whom the Lord shall consume with the what? The bread of his mouth and the what? Brightness of his coming. So the Pope is going to face the span of it. Our sincere committee on final of it is going to face the fire. It's going to be destroyed. First, Peter will not be with it. Right? No, Peter. The next thing we have to do, watch me. Here is watch, watch, watch this. I'm just telling you this. All this is a part of the stuff. And maybe, maybe this evening, maybe not. Do you know we could tie in, watch, watch. Watch. I have a next chart, watch. I will take this chart off and write a big chart. The chart ends, the last word on the chart is called religion. The first word on the chart is because of Christ. Do you know you can tie the two? And tie the whole study together as one? Just give us an exercise, and this is the exercise. We'll be like taking spiritual truths and tying in from Vicar of Christ to communion. Once we do that, we get Revelation to think good and clear. That is where we have to continue. Amen, okay. brethren? Amen. That's what we have to continue. And then what we have to go now, we have to go and deal with the history of the movement of the papacy. You have heard of the word follow me, the same word follow me massacre? You know this wicked folks and them put up a big, big picture. It's wider than this, and it's tall as a part of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican of, of, of indigenous being murdered by the French army under the temporal reign of the Pope. Good Lord, this is more than time to take down your picture. What did he say? You know, they still have the picture. I have a picture with Pope Francis sitting on a throne and that picture on his, on his right hand side. Mm -hmm. still have the and guess what? When the Pope was taken captive, watch me. When the Pope was taken captive, the fool was in the Sistine Chapel with some of his cardinals. And as he was inside sitting down, they hear loud, loud voices outside and ash chopping on door and so on. <laughs> and the French army coming. When the French army take him out and lead him captive, he had to pass right by the picture. <laughs> <laughs> he had to pass right by that picture and say, so when he passed, I don't watch it. I'm going to exile. You see, God is a very, very wise God. God is very smart. Who was the first person that presented Sunday to the God of Jesus? God didn't give way for Pius VII. He gave them a man's number, which is a man's six. Six. And guess which four was overthrown? Pius VI. Isn't that not shocking? It started with a pious. It temporarily ended with what? A pious. It started with a pious the first, which was the first day. And it ended with a pious the sixth six. number of man. Amen. Amen, brethren? Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's when it ended with. <laughs> And all the pious stuff, when we reach pious, we felt it will work too. Yes, I did. The word here, you see, was just a word meaning the government of the Pope. It's just the government of the government of the Pope. The spiritual power versus what? Temporal power. That's what they call it. Okay? So, brother, do you understand as far, right? Yeah. Now, we have real beautiful places to go. We ain't understand, we ain't touch nothing yet. Because you need to understand, let me tell you something. Some people say, well, the French Revolution over to the Pope. No, 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 no. 
the French Revolution ended. And when it ended, and Napoleon took over, it is that phase of the French Revolution that overthrew the Pope. Both phrases were what we call Jacobinian Republicanism. Mm -hmm. Were what? Jacobinian Republicanism. Remember that, don't forget that. Both phases. But one was a directorate Jacobinian Republic, and one was an empire Jacobinian Republic. It was the em empire rate, I should call it. Jacobinian Republic that overthrew the papacy. You remember it? Yeah. So you have to be careful. You have to touch all of that. One more important thing to tell you. Who do you think Chuck Martin Luther and all of them to stop the Reformation? Charles, Charles V. Charles V. was a Spanish. How could a Spanish be ruling way in Germany and all them places? Because there was an entity called the Holy Roman Empire which started in seven something after Christ. And it embraced places like Spain, Portugal, uh, Italy, France sometimes, Germany, different German states, Prussia, Austria. All those encompass what was called the Holy Roman Empire. It is they that tried to stop the Reformation with Luther. And guess what? By the time the French Revolution had reached its empire in state. Watch me. By 1808, the whole Holy Roman Empire had disappeared. Mm -hmm. Napoleon single-handedly destroyed each one. And when they each one that make it up and he tell them, liberty, equality, fraternity. But that was Jacobinian Republicanism. Mm -hmm. Not Jeffersonian Republicanism, which was what he started for. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. You have to know the difference. We'll be going there. You have something wonderful to look at there. You'll be shocked about it. Amen? Mm -hmm. And Paul Bills here, the Rothschilds knew that they had given orders to the directorate. Watch how smart the Rothschilds were. They gave orders to the directorate, abolish it, they make sure next book don't come back here. So Rothschild and them started drink up when the coke gets overthrown and rejoice. But he knew that the Catholic Church knew about the Rothschild. So they tell Napoleon, make sure when he had the book, take all his papers, all his books, everything. <laughs> so they will go through and take out any evidence about themselves. <laughs> and they give back the Pope the rest. <laughs> Did you see that? But wait, that, not only that happened, by the time they say to go over the Pope, Napoleon didn't go on to Napoleon tell Garcia, you and Milan go on the way. So when Milan, when, when, when Garcia reached, he wanted to rush and attack the city of Rome. He stand up and wait and beg them to let him in. Could you imagine that? Everybody seemed to be afraid of something. Well, those who were in favor of overthrowing the Pope let him in. And he entered without signing a shot. When he reached by a fort, St. Angelo, where many of the paper, papers here, the guns and the troops, imagine the papers here, their own army. He tell them, surrender. They say, give us two days. He said, no, four hours. <laughs> one by one, they fight out. He take it take without a shot. But Garcia himself knew what was going on behind the scenes. He didn't go. He sent General Hala. He said, Hala, you go. Because someone they think something will happen to them. But you see, after Hala went and took over capital and so on, and after the papacy was restored, word started to spread. Those who knew it was the Rothschild behind it. The Rothschild started to take them down one by one. We'll see a day standing by a window, secret they just can't push him out and murder him. They killed Bertia because they didn't want Bertia to reveal who it was. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine that? Mm -hmm. They push him out and all the kill him. Many of the others there who were behind the overtrain of the papacy, one by one they died by poison, mysterious, mysteriously died by poison. Because the Russia started to cover for him. 
Dig it like that, my dear brother. Dig it like that. You see, so it was, so even though they did their wickedness, they had to pay for their wickedness. And Mr. Gelotin, the Jewish man who invented the Gelotin, he said, Gelotin, take it off. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because now they start to cover up. Those guys you see at the Gelotin chopping off heads. All of them went and get their head chopped off. <laughs> so the point about it is that the whole revolution yeah, ended in Syria. Yeah. Do you get that clear, my dear brethren? Yes. Do you get that clear? Yes. But we have more things to touch. We have plenty of things to touch. You'll be shocked when you understand what about it. Okay, let us have our closing prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you for what you have shown us. We thank you for the wisdom you have given to us. We thank you for preparing us for the end which is supposed to be coming. May we abide in the truth and keep in those truths. And may we be great apostles preaching the truth and ending the history of this world and our generation. In Jesus' holy name we pray. We come to the end of the day. Amen. Amen.